Welcome to Quranic Parenting. Uh, last week we began our first session of this series on uh, intentional parenting, right? Because with all, as with all things, we have to have the right intention, right? And so even with our parenting journey, we have to really uh, confront and, and come to terms with what are our intentions with wanting to be parents. And so we spent a lot of time exploring that, but first we looked at what parenting today looks like, right? Because parenthood, of course, um, in our society today is very different than the ideals of what uh, our dean teaches us or aspires to uh, us to, right? So we, we want to examine that, what we're dealing with, right? So we, we went through some of the trends that we're seeing with people delaying marriage as well as motherhood, right? So a lot of women, because of the opportunities afforded to them now, they're delaying uh, this part of their life until, uh, you know, their mid-30s or later. And then um, just some experiences of the pressures that both uh, women and men feel in terms of uh, managing, uh, you know, the parenting, whether they're doing it as a, a couple uh, in, in, a, in a nuclear, you know, traditional family or as single parents, but um, each gender does have some, uh, some pressures that are unique to them. And so just kind of exploring some of the data there. And then uh, we also talked about how and the reason why it's so different is because we are in a time where a lot of things are being redefined, right? Uh, gender roles, you know, the, the institutions of marriage, what it, what it even looks like um, now in this society is very, again, different than what it always has been traditional because you'll find different types of families or family units or marriages, marriage unions. Um, and so we want to really be aware of, of what we're up against. Of course, the economics and uh, behind why people marry, the goals and objectives of, of families and couples are also different in some cases. In many cases, I should say, um, cultural shifts and attitudes towards, uh, for example, premarital uh, relations and monogamous relationships are also very different than what it was in the past. And then the importance of having partners that have um, either the same or similar religious affiliation and commitment, right, to those conservative values is also different. You find a lot of people now marrying um, sometimes not only uh, people who are not necessarily on the same wavelength or path, but even outside of the faith. It's, it's more and more common. So these are things we have to be aware of. And then we talked about the importance of, when we talk about intentionality, that there are two mindsets that you have in all things, right? And, and everybody in the world is of one of these two minds. You're either thinking in worldly terms, uh, whether it's parenting or marriage or, 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 or anything else, or you're thinking in otherworldly terms, right? So when it comes to parenting, the mindsets are you're you're focused on worldly parenting, what that, and we kind of explore what that means, and then what other worldly parenting is, is of course you're, you're setting your sights on the next world, on, on what will get you there. So parenting becomes a means to that end, whereas the worldly parenting is more focused on, you know, just the benefits of coming together, having a family, having children, and you get really caught up in that, right? And so I also just reminded everyone of the cost of parenting today, um, that it's quite expensive. I'm um, oh, sorry. So according uh, to one study, $233,000 or $610 to raise one child today, right? And this is from 2015, so it's probably even more now with all the inflation costs and, and costs of food and gas and clothing and everything, right? So we're, it's very difficult for many people to have children because of this reason. Um, and just to bring it back to that point of worldly versus otherworldly, a lot of times people get caught up in the experience of being pregnant or having the, you know, the baby pictures and the, the newborn phase, because that is a phase that is fun, right? There's a, there's a celebratory aspect of obviously bringing in a new life, but having a lot of celebration around that. So people will get caught up in that, but then they don't think that that child will grow and you are then responsible for making sure that it is provided for in every sense of the word, but spiritually, most importantly, that you have to raise it with the values w w that it can maintain um, its, its religious identity. And that, that, that's a lot of work for parents. So we have to look beyond just this commercialization of parenting that we uh, unfortunately see everywhere around us. And then um, 
you know, a reminder about the fact that it is our duty, right? Parenting is an amana. It's our responsibility to make sure that we raise our children on fitra. Um, otherwise, they will stray. And, and this is the, the task before us as parents. So really having the understanding of what it means to have the otherworldly lens is that you realize the objective is to raise inshallah, the next generation of believers, and that um, will be your means to paradise, inshallah. And so, you know, the uh, intentional, you know, the questions that we have to ask ourselves when we want to be intentional about parenting is, why do I want to become a parent? How do I plan uh, to prepare for parenthood? Mashallah, I had a sister uh, earlier in our dhikr, um, she's single, and she said she's not married, but she asked if she could stay, and I told her, you are the shining example that I always like to, to show people that yes, when you are um, attending these types of events, whether it's parenting or marriage, without, you know, in preparation, you are actually doing it right. We all should have been doing that. We all should have been sitting into these types of classes long before we ever got ourselves uh, in, in a marital or a you know, parenting role because the preparation is so necessary, it's so necessary to do that preparatory work. And then when do I plan to get started, right? So asking these questions, we talked a lot about what parent is and what it isn't. So I mentioned that it's an aman, it's a trust from God. It's a sunnah, obviously, of the Prophet he had children. It's a gift. Parenting is a gift. There, We mentioned also in the previous dhikr that we had, one of the sisters reminded us to make dua for those who wish to have children because there are many who are struggling with infertility and they... Um, they really want this gift of, of parent to, uh, to be a parent. And so when you have it, you have to see that Allah pref you know, gave you, preferred you in, for this role, and it is uh, a, an immense, immense gift as well as an amana. And then it's also, also going to be a test of faith because as Allah subhanahu wa tells us that he will try us, he will test us through our children, right? Uh, and so you will have times where things are going to be difficult. It comes part, part, uh, it's part and parcel of being a parent. And what parenting isn't is this rite of passage that has to happen just because you're married. Because if that's what you think, then you're not doing it for the greater goals of, of wanting to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're just doing it because your family's pressuring you, right? Your mom is asking you, your grandma is asking you, and your limited understanding is, well, I just have to get I have to have children now, just like I had to get married now. You see that that's a very flat, um, lacking, uh, lackluster intention. It's just like I'm just doing something because it's custom. But we have to be better about our intentions, right? Uh, avoiding the criticism of family or society or community is not a reason to have children. It's because you want to raise good you know, believers, and you want to be a part of that. And that's the, re the intention you have to come at it with. And then it's also not just for fun and games, right? As we mentioned earlier, the celebratory sort of uh, excitement around children or marriage is often what we get caught up in, but that is not the purpose of it. It's the, the wedding is not the purpose of a marriage, and neither is the baby shower a purpose of parenting, right? Um, it's also not a way to exploit oneself or family. So if you're having children so that they can continue the family business and you can use them for free labor, <laughs> certainly not uh, you know, a good intention. Um, and it's also not a way to parade uh, your children around just as little extensions of you because sometimes parents think of their children as their property and you know I want a good image uh, in front of people so I'm going to uh, have multiple children just so that I can show how cute my kids are, how well behaved they are, they're model children, they go to school, they finish their Quran khatam by the age of seven, I am going to throw them a party and we just make it all the spectacle which is look at me, I'm such a great person, I have such beautiful amazing children and look at me, look at me. These are the wrong intentions. It has to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we talked about the importance of having a parental vow, right, which we, uh, because it's Quranic parenting, we're going back to the Quran to see these things modeled for us. So we mentioned Hana bint Faqud, who is the mother of uh, our mother Maryam alayhi salam, and how she literally made a vow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that she, whatever was in her womb, that she was offering it in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is intentional parenting. That is a perfect example of someone who understands that when a child is, you know, Allah has blessed you with a child, that your mind should not be about how you're going to benefit from this child um, in this life, but rather that that child grows up to to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is on the right path and is a 
is uh, is an agent of, of of guidance for others, of light, of uh, and worships Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as He so deserves. That that is the intention, right? And so she made that beautiful intention. And then we also talked about the prayer because our du'as are very important and we sometimes forget. There's a lot of anxiety in parenting today, I know, because I talk to a lot of parents. And the anxiety is always directed towards other people. Do you know someone I can ask for this? Uh, is there a therapist? Is there this? I need help with my child with this. And we're always looking at the worldly means of how to address a lot of our fears. But then when you ask Okay, I understand you're worried about your child's behavior, their friends, you know, whether or not their, their dean is strong. But what are you doing in terms of spiritually addressing those concerns, right? If you're just picking up the phone and calling and trying to network, but then you're not waking up in the middle of the night, right? And this goes for the mothers and the fathers. We have to get up. And we have to ask the only one who can actually change our children's situation, whether it's a health issue, a mental health issue, a behavioral issue, whatever it is, the only one who can actually bring about the change you're seeking is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you cannot bypass Allah and then go through everyone else, right? You have to get up and uh, the your uh, real sincerity of concern is shown by how much you seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because otherwise it's lip service. Oh, I'm so worried about my kids. If you're worried about your kids, show you're worried. Get up. D compromise your sleep. Right? Show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am really stressed out about my children's guidance. Ya Allah, please guide them. Please guide them. Please guide them. And also make good choices for them. Right? Which we're going to get to today in session two. This is just a summary. But it's so important that we really uh, use the means that Allah subhanahu wa has given us. The Prophet ﷺ reminded us that the du'a is the weapon of the believer. So if you're battling demons, then take out your weapons, right? And use them, which are your du'as. We talked about parental self-reflection. It's very important that we... Uh, we, of course, have those high expectations and we work towards them, but we also remember that outcomes we don't control, right? It's very important to have that pause to say, okay, I'm trying my best, I'm doing everything, but at the end of the day, they belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I can only do my best. When you have prophets, and that's why we have the stories of the prophets to remind us, like Prophet Nuh, السلام, who we know struggled because his son literally disobeyed him and did not believe, and that was a struggle for a prophet of God, right? So if he you know, had to face this, uh, this reality that outcomes are only decreed by Allah, then certainly we do as well, and we have to submit. Now, that doesn't mean we stop praying and we, get, we become resigned. No, it just means that at a certain point you know what you can do and what you can't do, but hold yourself accountable, right? Hold yourself accountable. And this is, again, where constantly going back to, um, you know, asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you, to, to, to surrender to his decree, and also asking for those things that you want with uh, clarity. Be very descriptive in your du'as. You know, just to do general du'as, oh Allah, protect my children. Yes, but How? What do you mean by that? Protect them from what harms? Do you know the harms? Are you aware of all the harms? Show that you really are, like be explicit as possible in your du'as because that will give you, again, um, that sense of uh, ownership of, of, of uh, you know, your responsibility as a parent, but also connect you to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can help you. So make sh making sure to do that. And these are all from the examples, again, from the Qur'an uh, that, we, uh, that we can learn from. So, inshallah, really important to, um, to, to know that. So this is the summary. And again, uh, you, know, you can go back and watch the first video from last week to get more in-depth discussion on all of those things. I'm just summarizing before we get into today's discussion. So these are the points of the summary that um, you can go ahead and, if you want, uh, just screenshot or take... Um, and then we'll go ahead and begin for session two. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we start obviously with intentionality. And now that we've, um, inshallah, aligned ourselves with the proper intentions, we need to look at the target. And the target is the best of examples, the Prophet ﷺ. He is enough for us to know how to parent effectively. If we learn his methodology, his ways, his teachings, his words, we will, inshallah, become effective parents. If we abandon his ways and take our own ways, our, mom, our mother's ways, our father's ways, our grandparents' ways, our culture's ways, we will struggle. So that's really as simple as we can, uh, you know, s uh, state that that the Prophet ﷺ is the best of examples. So now, what does that mean? 
Well, here is a hadith that is often uh, related when we talk about marriage, where the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us about um, how to approach parenting, right? And he reminds us, Ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyati. Each of you, every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his or her flock. And then he goes into the details of what that means, right? The leader of a people, so the general community leader or leader of a, a nation is a guardian and, and is responsible for his or her subjects. A man is the guardian of his family, and he is responsible for them. So the wording, it matters here, because family is not specified to just wife and children. He also has his parents, his siblings, other people that he also is responsible for. And sometimes women need to be reminded of that, right? That he is responsible for all of the, you know, maintaining all of that. And so sometimes you have to let him go, right? Let him tend to other family needs. And it's difficult, but it's a good reminder for us. And then the woman is the guardian of her husband's home and his children, and she is responsible for them. So this is why we say that the domain of the house and the way the house is run, the household, the culture that's in the household is the domain of women, right? She should be allowed to really dictate and to lead, inshallah, of course, with her husband there to support her. But this is where running a household um, effectively, because the woman is likely doing a lot of that management anyway, should be her domain and she can flourish in that responsibility as a leader, because a shepherd is, is a leadership role, right? So he's delineating all of the ways that we are leading independently. And then uh, the servant of a man is a guardian of the property of his master, and he's responsible for it. No doubt, every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his or her flock. And I love this because even though it's not mentioned here, when we are talking to our children about these types of messages from our Prophet ﷺ, that last line matters because if we want empowered children, we want children with strong Muslim identities, we have to also imbue in them this understanding that they also are called to leadership roles. So give your children responsibility early on. Let them flourish as leaders in their own way with between their siblings uh, as they're teaching them or cousins or other friends. Give them responsibility early. Don't coddle them because when we overly coddle children, we, uh, we then create these imbalances and these codependencies that they don't know how to uh, find their, their voice or their, you know, their their, the, the, uh, the, the role that, uh, of leadership that, that is expected of them. If you look at the seerah, the Prophet was, uh, because he was the most emotionally intelligent human being ever, he made space for all of the community members. Everyone felt heard and listened to and felt that they had a role in that community. He would even seek out the youth and give them leadership roles for that reason. So what about us in our households? When we say, no, 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 and especially when it comes to you know, uh, some of our cultures where there's a major disparity between how um, you know, some genders are treated versus others. So you'll find a lot of the young girls in many households and many cultures doing a lot of the, the work and taking on a lot of responsibility, helping their parents. But then there's a double standard when it comes to boys. Right? No, no, no. That's their boys. Let them go out and and do other things, but not uh, girls' work. Right? Not not the housework. This is completely anti-Sunnah. The Prophet was known to to wash his own dishes, mend his own clothes, help in the household. So, what are we saying when we are, um, you know, creating this? this disparity and and teaching our boys that to to help in the house is not something becoming of a young boy and he should just be out but the girls have to do it all this is wrong and that's why if we don't know these things then obviously we're going to pass on these uh, these just you know just wrong messages and and uh, feel the effects of that as the resentment between uh, in our in our children grows because it's it's not a it's not a fair system right so that's just a side note but this hadith um, I love because when you think of a shepherd, right, look at this picture. This picture is a beautiful picture of a shepherd, and look how he is overlooking his, uh, you know, flock, and he has some tools around him, right? He's holding his staff, which is the crook. Uh, this is a, a very important tool that shepherds use because it gives them the ability to do what? First of all, it serves as an extended arm, okay? So, Look at the amount of, in this image anyway, there's several animals. Um, so for him to be able to 
show the boundaries for his flock, he has to have an extended arm, and that's where the crook uh, can also the staff of the of the of the uh, shepherd can come in place. He extends his arm this way, and the sheep know to go this way, right? So that tells us that one of the important parts of parenting is that we have to have reach. We have to know how to reach our children, which means communication. If we don't have strong communication skills, then we will not know how to uh, reach them. We won't, they won't listen to us just the same way as if he's trying to get their attention and he's waving his, his uh, you know, arms, but they can't see it. It's because he's not using the tools at his disposal to actually get the message across, which is don't go there or, or go here, right? So that's the shepherd. It's on the shepherd to know how to communicate. The other important thing that it does is also gives him control, right? So he's reaching them through communication, but also that sense of control, because yes, there are boundaries that he's supposed to be protecting uh, the flock from. So that's the other parenting tool that we need to have. We have to be able to also um, make sure that we uh, create, you know, th that we uh, have that stability and, and safety um, and that we're showing control as parents, right? So we have to have the reach, we have to have the control. And uh, the last, which is, um, you know, the, the, the part of the, the top part of the staff has a crook. It's like a, cro you know, crooked sort of um, bent over part. And that's intentional because when the animal falls, for example, into um, a ditch or somewhere that it shouldn't go. To you can imagine, these animals are quite heavy, right? And so, for a shepherd to not be able to help the animal up, right, to get out of that dangerous situation, um, then it would perish. So immediately, that crook can be used to take, uh, put it either around the neck of the animal or around the ankle or whatever is lodged. And so the shepherd can pull the animal out to safety, right? So that safety, that control, that reach, these are the three main tools that parents have to have and learn from the example of a shepherd. And so, you know, we mentioned uh, th this one, you know, tool that, that is at his disposal. Um, but then there are other things that the shepherd also does in order to make this happen. First of all, who, you know, if you, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been on a farm or ha know any shepherds personally, um, but if you know that life, you know that they have to wake up early, right? You cannot effectively lead a flock anywhere and take care of them if you're going to sleep in. Right, because they are on a different uh, schedule. They, they animals tend to wake up, um, you know, with with the sunrise, and they have their own needs that need to be met. So you have to be ahead. And so a lot of people who live these types of homestead lives or, or shepherding lives, they will be awake very early. Now, how does that relate to parenting? That translates to we have to be ahead, right? We cannot be. A, uh, totally oblivious to what's going on in the world of children, just like a shepherd cannot be oblivious to the needs of his flock. So you have to be reading. You have to know what's going on in their world, what's happening at school, if especially, especially if you're sending your children to public school. That is so critical that you know what's happening in their classroom, who their teachers are, what are the philosophies of that teacher, because you will wit you're witnessing it right now. It's like a takeover of our educational system. There are people with agendas literally trying to bring in and indoctrinate our children with their own ideas. And if you don't know that, and if you don't know how to even be aware of that or, or, or how to handle that situation, then you're going to get yourself in trouble because your children will be in these classes for eight, ten hours a day learning things that are antithetical to your faith and your culture and your uh, home life. And that influence is going to increase over time. So we have to be ahead. We have to know what's going on at school. We have to know what's going on with their friends groups. Who are they talking to? What kind of friends? Listen in on some of their discussions. It's OK. This whole idea of, oh, I have to respect my children's privacy. To what end? If, especially if you don't know their, the quality of their friends. You're going to let them go into their rooms, close doors, and have no idea what they're talking about? This is wrong. Open door policies, especially when they're young. They shouldn't be closing off. Why? What are you talking about that, that someone else, if they passed by, it would be you know, wrong or, or you would feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uncomfortable with that. So uh, these are the types of rules. If we implement them in our house at an early, when they're young, then it'll be very normal for them. So, you know, making sure that we know what's going on also in the world of, uh, of, of social media. A lot of parents give their kids these devices. 
uh, not realizing that these devices are more dangerous than weapons. They are more dangerous than weapons, right? If you, if you, would, you couldn't even think of giving your child an actual gun with bullets loaded, but you would happily give them a device without any supervision, no parental controls, no even, um, you know, time, like, management, where it's like, oh, they could just have it, it's fine. Then it's the same as just telling them, here, play with this gun. It's fine. It's actually worse, I should say, because what this exposes them to um, is a slow and painful death. It's, you know, whereas a weapon is instantaneous, this is a slow death of the soul when they're exposed to the evil that can come from this, this thing. So we have to be very careful about making sure that we know what is going on and that we're ahead, right? So the shepherd, again, going back to this model, wakes up early, gets their food pre prepared, and also the shepherd knows the boundaries of where to go. So you as a parent have to know those boundaries. That's where that, again, control, reach, and safety comes into play. And that staff, by the way, is also used to test the grounds. So I know, for example, parents, some parents, um, I'm just going to mention this because I know there is this, in my generation, Generation X, there are some parents who are, they're you know, maybe like Luddites, which are people who are like anti-technology. They're just not really interested, right? And if you have that attitude, I understand. Personally, you don't need to be on social media. You don't need to have a single presence. But that does not absolve you of the responsibility of knowing what is on social media. You get it? You don't have to have a presence. You don't have to be active. But you should know what's happening in the world of social media. And so that is where that staff of testing the ground before the flock you know, goes is an essential role of the shepherd. Because he has to make sure it's not quicksand, you know, or it's not a slippery is slope that they're going to fall slide and, and to their end. So this is where we as parents have to really take this um, analogy of the shepherd to heart and learn from it. And remember, we are responsible ultimately. Now, I love this because this goes to, um, this is just, uh, sorry, this is um, based on this quote up here at the top, a vessel only pours out what it contains, is actually from a famous uh, story from Sayyidina Isa salam that we uh, have, where he was once with his disciples, and he walked um, by a group of men, and those men cursed him. Okay, so he's with his disciples, they cursed him, and he responds with da'a. You know, salamu alaykum, or a greeting, a beautiful greeting. So his disciples are shocked, like, why would you do that? They cursed you, you know, they didn't understand. And his response was this. A vessel only pours out what it contains. This is so beautiful because if we all understood this and we understood uh, for ourselves first and foremost to really manage our vessels, right, our hearts, our bodies, our minds, and to make sure that we're careful of what we are consuming and what we're putting into it, then we can have that same understanding when it comes to our children and realize I want my children to have the purest, right, um, of vessels. And how can I do that as parents? So why is this image so powerful? I use this image a lot, um, especially when I talk to youth, because I, I will say to them, tell me what you see here. So any guesses? What do we see here, you guys? What, what are these glasses of? Of what? Okay. You've listened to my uh, talks before. <laughs> Anyone else? So I get answers like tea, uh, some even say beer, uh, I don't know why they know that, but okay, um, Coke, uh, you know, the coffee, they'll throw out all of these answers, and I'm like, good, good, keep coming, keep coming. And then they're mortified when I tell them, actually, this is from a water treatment facility. These are all different cups of water that have, obviously, there's contaminated water here, right? So they test levels of, of different water sources. So why is this such a powerful image? Because we're all human beings. We're all here with the same opportunities to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're all here, and yes, we'll have different struggles and different tests in our life, but we ultimately choose what we consume, right? What we take in. Every one of us has the same uh, free will, right, to choose uh, good versus, you know, evil in every instance. And so if we're not cognizant of that, then, you know, we want, obviously, all of us, inshallah, we want to be that first cup on the right, clear, pure, you know, untainted. 
But because we're not paying attention to what we're consuming, we end up taking in, oh, a little bit here, it's okay. A little bit here, it's okay. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to read Quran today, but I'm going to go and, you know, watch a, a Netflix series and waste my brain cells. Okay. Well, you do that over time, and it's going to turn into that dark drink at the t end, right? Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always calling us to his remembrance and to do good works and to really think about how can I polish this vessel of mine because I'm accumulating sins all the time. But we, we have to be mindful of that. And, and then when we are mindful of our own vessels, then inshallah we can uh, have that uh, as part of our parenting as well, which is really essential. So here are the prophetic uh, principles back to that shepherding model um, that we want to think about. And, and the reason why, again, that image, I wanted you to hold it is because you have to be a person of character before you demand it of others. You cannot be a person of low character and then expect that your children are going to have high character. But there are a lot of people who curse, who lie, who use, raise their voice, who, are, you know, who, who do not have good character, who are impatient, who explode, but then they want model children. Right? I want my children to be perfect. It doesn't work that way. So when we say you have to be a leader, you have to be responsible, we are saying you have to do it first, and then your children will learn from you. You have to be knowledgeable. You have to know your deen. There are a lot of parents who don't invest in their own knowledge of deen. They don't uh, study aqidah or fiqh or uh, Qur'an. They don't know how to read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will not invest in themselves, but they will bring their kids to the Sunday school and pay the fees and then you know, really get hard on them for why aren't you doing your work? Why aren't you doing your work? But if it's time to read Qur'an with them, and they come to you and you say, oh, I don't know how to read, go to so-and-so. How can you, how are you effective? You have to learn to, to be able to model what you want for, me, for your children so that when they see you doing it, then it's normal for them. But if they're like, oh, you don't even do it, why should I do it? And, the, and once they get to the, uh, to the age of logic and reasoning and being able to talk back, they will come to you. You don't even do it, why should I do it? Right? You don't, and that's, and then how can you defend that argument? So you have to be knowledgeable. You also have to be attentive. If you're always looking at your devices when they're talking to you, uh huh, uh huh, and you know, we're all guilty of this to a certain degree, but you have to have the presence to say, wait a second, my child has entered the space and I have a short time with them. And this is the heartbreaking thing about parenting. If you have ever met anybody who's in the later stage where they're empty nesters, they cry for the years that they neglected their children. Because now they're alone. Now there's no sounds in their home. Now there's no doors opening and closing and you know all of those noises that children make, the laughter. It's none of it. It's dead silence. And it's very uncomfortable for a lot of people who are lonely in isolation. You know, there are entire groups of people and, and, and areas in our world where people are, there's a crisis of loneliness because parents have children that have left them and now they have nobody. So if we don't realize and appreciate the value of our children when they come in uh, to our space, and honestly, it's one of the most heartbreaking things, and I'm speaking as a mother, like when you watch your children suddenly overnight, they're grown, and you're like, Ya Allah, all those years when I could hold them. You know, I see some precious babies here with us. Hold those children, and do not ever forget that that will, it's not going to last. And they're going to grow up and they're going to go on their own path. And it's really hard. But we have to be attentive to, attentive to them. So when they come to you and they want to tell you a story, and you've heard it a thousand times before, or, or they're one of those, uh, and then, and then, and then, and then, and it just never ends. It's hard because we have things to do. But wallahi, just give yourself pause and say, I have to appreciate this this joy that this child is presenting in me because a lot of the adults in the world have lost it. Our hearts have just lost joy, awe of Allah. We don't get excited about things that are deserving to get excited, right? So when a child comes to you, they're kind of, they're an ayah, they're a sign for you from God that look, look at this child who can find joy in a leaf, in a rock, in a pebble. So be attentive. And that means put the phone away. Look at them. Our eye, parental eye, is so potent. We don't re realize that our children are hungry for our eye. They want to be seen. They want to know that we, they matter. And nobody can do that more than we can. Nobody.
Nobody can, can give them that, uh, that, that feeling of I see you more than the parent. So be attentive. Listen to their stories. Answer their questions. Why, Mommy? Why, Daddy? Answer. Be in control, right? Back to the shepherd model. You have to know how to know the difference between authority, right? Authoritarian versus authoritative. Authoritarian is I have to raise my voice to get something from you. I have to threaten you. I have to take something away from you, snatch it from your hands. If you're doing that, you have no control. You have no control. You're forcing control. You are demanding respect, but you're not commanding it. Commanding respect is having management of your emotions and speaking in a very direct voice so that the child knows that you, there's no option, right? If you ask them to do something, you give them the instruction, and it's not, um, you know, there's no debate because you're the authority. You've established yourself as an authority. But if you're having to debate every single time, we've lost control. And so you have to go back to how can I establish that communication? Because if the child doesn't feel like they want to listen to you, maybe there's something that you need to explore there. Why? Why don't you want to listen to me? Are you upset with me? Is there some resentment you're holding? Talk to me. Let me know so I can heal that wound because you're, you're, you're coming at me with this aggression. No, no. Well, there's more to it. And if we actually probe a little bit, we might find that they are holding on to some pain. So explore that and communicate. Be resilient. As we mentioned, you have to realize you're not always going to be in control and you have to be able to bear through the tough times and not fall apart. Inshallah, Allah is with you and your dua are powerful. And remember, they ultimately belong to Him. But don't fall apart just because you have a crisis or a problem with your children. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be compassionate, children and youth, especially teens, need empathy. They need compassion from us more than they need our uh, demands and our threats and all those ultimatums. They need compassion and patience and respect. Children deserve to be respected. If they don't want to wear, for example, a shirt and you are forcing them to wear it, unless you know there's a real reason you have to ask why. Maybe they they feel, and I know I have, uh, you know, I, I've seen this happen too. Some some children are more sensitive to certain fabrics, for example. So if they're telling you it's itchy, I don't like it, please. Then you have to find a solution. Maybe wear an undershirt, but not to be like, no, you must, because that's disrespecting the very basic need, which is I am uncomfortable and I don't want to go to this event for five six hours, miserable because you want me to look like a little trophy kid. So respecting your children is meeting their needs uh, or listening to what their needs are and trying to meet them, but actually wanting to hear what's the issue, not be quiet. What do you know? Oh, the, the way so many people talk to young children. Or if they don't want to eat something, don't force them. Sometimes, you know, some picky eaters, I understand, they might like the attention of being the picky eater in the family. So you kind of have to discern whether or not that's happening or if it's really that they don't like something. And uh, work, you know, navigate that conversation respectfully. Be vigilant, be consistent, be humble. All of these qualities we have to possess, inshallah, if we want to be effective parents, right? And so how do we prepare for leadership? Well, you know, we have to understand our self well, our own needs, the needs of those in our care, the needs, uh, um, I'm sorry, we have to understand those in our care and also their needs, the potential dangers and threats that are out there, and how to prevent with proper measures. We have to seek the help when necessary. Sometimes, you know, we, we don't seek help at all, which is a problem because we are a deen of nasiha and we should seek out people with experience who can help us. But do it, obviously, in a way that is um, you know, comfortable for you. And ultimately, the most important thing that we do is we rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submit to his will. So constantly bringing it back to Allah. Now, because we, this is Quranic parenting and we are talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we need to now uh, set our sight on, the, on, the, on, on him, right? Our, on, on his blessed... Uh, countenance and example for us. So the character of the Prophet ﷺ, as was described in many hadith, 
um, was likened to a walking Qur'an, right? وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ He had the greatest character, right? The Prophet ﷺ was described in the Qur'an directly in chapter 68, 4, verse 4, as having the great, uh, a great character. So, and then, of course, Allah also reminds us, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala also reminds us that He is our example, right? In chapter 33, verse 21. Um, and that He, subhanAllah, in everything He did, right? Uh, every word He said, all of His um, concerns, His worries were for us, right? He wants our success. And here in chapter 9, verse 128, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, There has certainly come to you an apostle from among yourselves, grievous to him, is your distress. So he is, is, is you know, um, pained by our burdens, subhanAllah. He has a deep concern for you and is most kind and merciful to the faithful. So, you know, think about that when you're, again, looking at his example and his words and his instructions, that it's all out of love. It's out of concern. And that's where, um, you know, uh, he, where he's coming from always when it comes to these things. And then the Prophet ﷺ is the most gentle. So by, again, all from the Qur'an, these verses, so by mercy from Allah, O Muhammad, uh, you were lenient with them, right? Um, and if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from uh, about you. So just mentioning his beautiful qualities, that he was always lenient and gentle with people. So this is our example. And if we don't see ourselves reflected in anything here, if we don't have gentleness, we're not concerned, we, we're kind of in our own world's, self-centered, egoistic, uh, you know, lives, we're very, very far from his uh, example. And of course, character is virtue. So you have to think about all the virtues that he possessed. He was the most trustworthy, the most honest, the most loving, the most kind, the most compassionate. He was always empathic with everyone, and we'll get to that in a moment. But all of these things are, um, speak of his character. Also, the descriptions of him in the hadith. So those are from the Qur'an. And here are the hadith that describe him. Uh, said Aisha, she says, uh, or I'm sorry, Qattada, he, he said to say to Aisha, O oh, mother of the believers, tell me about the character of the Messenger of Allah. And she asked him, have you not read the Qur'an? I, of course, he says. And she said, verily, the character of the Prophet wasallam was the Qur'an. So he was the Qur'an, again, walking, right? Um, how he honored his children, or children in general, not only his own children, but others as well. This is from Anas ibn Malik. He said that the Prophet ﷺ would pass by young boys and greet them with peace. So you want to think about that. Do you do that? Do you Are children invisible to you other than your own? I've, I feel like a lot of us are just walking by our children. You see in this community, nobody wants to greet the children. They just walk right by because they see them as nuisances. We shoo children away all the time. Go to the kids section. Why are you here? Or we see um, this, and I always have to catch myself because we do this uh, reflexively. We'll see families. We'll see our friends. Oh, assalamu alaikum. And the kids are just standing there. And nobody's turning to the kids. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? This was his sunnah to go down and talk to the children, meet them at their eye level, ask them questions, engage them, make them feel seen and heard. And imagine if we all did that to our children to each other's children. What a beautiful community we have. But you have a lot of children who are invisible to their own parents and then they come to the community and they're invisible to the community. So you think they're not going to want to be seen elsewhere? Of course. And that's when the social media becomes something, right? Let me go get an Instagram, a TikTok, and then become insta-famous. Or let me go and join other groups that do see me, right? Because there are other people who are well willing to welcome our kids in fully embrace them, but it comes with a price. Give up your deen, right? Don't be Muslim and you can be part of this club of inclusivity. We're all a family, right? Um, this is the message that they're getting outside. So if we don't step up as a community and start seeing children and honoring them the way our Prophet ﷺ taught us, then we cannot complain when we find faith crises happening or them just not wanting to come to the masjid anymore. And this is a failure on us, right? Because we're, we've strayed so far from his example. The, pro, the Prophet was also playful with children, right? So he would play with Zainab, the daughter of Um Salama, and he would even like have little cute phrases like, Oh, Zainab, oh, Zainab. Just imagine him, him saying that to a, you know, uh, this little girl and how special she felt that here's the Prophet of Allah, you know, playing these little games with her. 
that's our that's our Prophet Sallallahu So he's our example. And this is not just for your own children, right? We have to be better when we're with uh, even children that are not our own. And then he was also very loving and endearing. So uh, there's many stories um, about uh, the Prophet Sallallahu with children, but one in particular is when this uh, boy who was called uh, Abu Umair, um, when he lost his little sparrow, the Prophet Sallallahu you know, really attended to him because he lost his bird, his pet bird. So the suffering of, of you know, children, even in these little things, when their toy breaks, right, when um, they drop their ice cream cone, <laughs> their little hearts broken over things that we might think are trivial. But if you don't stop and empathize and show them some compassion in that moment, then again, you're not following the Prophet said them. Because for some people, especially those who are not from cultures where pets are even kept, that's a, what's the big deal? It's just a bird. You know, there's millions of birds. That's the kind of attitude a lot of people have. That's so harsh to tell a child that. Even if they had a bug and they love that bug, you can't be like, oh, it's a big deal. It was just a little snail. Oh, well, it got crushed. No, it may have had a bond with that snail. Maybe it was talking to the snail. Maybe the snail was a friend or even with toys. So we have to be really gentle when we're with children, as was his example. This is, the, again, the character of the Prophet system. This is prophetic parenting. More hadiths. This is from Anas. So he says, I served the Prophet ﷺ for 10 years. He's not his child. And he never said, oof. Oof is what? It's the word that many of us say when we're frustrated, right? Oof. Oof. He didn't even say that. So imagine all of us were like, no. No. It's just automatic for some people. You know, and for no reason. A lot of us have become so tyrannical that we have the most arbitrary rules. Today, you can watch a little bit of TV tomorrow. No. Why? But you let me yesterday. No. I said so. That is tyranny. And that is so confusing to a young child. Like, you're not consistent in your parenting. Why is it based on your mood if I can have a piece of candy today, but then because you're bitter at the world, you want to cut me off from my joy? This is because we don't, there's no concept of like treat the child with respect and stop projecting your, all your anger and frustration onto this little pure vessel whose heart is in fitra and it's, he, he or she was sent to you so that you are uh, you know, reminded of God. We have to do better. But he, he didn't even say, oof. I can't even imagine, right? Because we all fail so miserably. But subhanAllah. And he says, um, why did you, he never even told him, why did you do so or so and so or didn't do? So imagine all of us when we get upset with our children for not cleaning their rooms or dishes. We do it, all of us. But we have to learn from his example that he didn't assign blame. And that's the point here. There was no shaming. You can certainly be responsible because you want to obviously, you know, lead your children to correct behavior. But the shaming is what we're addressing here. Right? The process didn't shame children. So if you're shaming your children, like, what's wrong with you? Right? Learn. We have to all learn. May Allah forgive us. Aisha then also reported, I have not seen anyone who resembled the Prophet ﷺ in terms of words, speech, and manners uh, more than Fatima, his daughter, uh, radiallahu anha. And she, now look, she's describing her, the interactions between the Prophet ﷺ and his daughter. So this is for all of us who have children, especially those who, are, who have daughters, fathers in particular. Look at how the father greeted his daughter. I mean, the Prophet greeted his daughter. When he saw her coming, he would greet her. He would stand up from his place. So imagine she went, enters the room. The Prophet would stand because he wanted to welcome her, right, embrace her. It wasn't like just come in and yeah sit there. No, it was, I'm gonna welcome you. And then he would go, you know, to her, or she would, you know, meet in the middle, kiss her, take her hand by the hand, and brought her to her seat. This was the Prophet Sallallahu with his own daughter. So how are we with our children? You know, sometimes we're pushing them away, or we're just again shooing them. He welcomed, and, and this was their way of, of visiting each other, this beautiful rapport of mutual respect, love, right, between their hearts. And she would do the same, right? 
when he would visit her, she responded because she learned from the best of examples. He modeled it for her, and then she would do the same. So she would stand and greet him and kiss him and also lead him to his seat. I mean, it's just so beautiful to imagine a father doing that for his own daughter, right, with so much love. But we can all do that. And, of course, for mothers, we can do that with our daughters and our sons. We should just learn. This goes for all, across the board. And then Abu Huraira reported that um, this uh, another Sahabi al Aqrab bin Habis saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kissing al Hassan, right? So uh, and you know and and he said, I have ten children. So here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is kissing his grandson, and this man is like, you know, I'm such a tough guy, right? Because he that is not his culture or custom or in his family that was not normal to have a grown man like doting and being affectionate to a young child. So he's trying to act tough. And he says to the Prophet I have 10 kids and I've never kissed any of them. Like as if it's a boastful comment, right? He's boasting to the Prophet And the Prophet says, he who does not show mercy towards children, then no mercy will be shown. So it, there's a direct correlation. If we are not merciful to our children, we better watch out. Because the most merciful does not forget. So be very careful about this attitude that a lot of people approach parenting like I have these defined roles and I don't bend because my dad was this way and my mom was this way. No, raise your children uh, differently than how you were raised because they were raised in a different time. Sayyidina Ali gave us that sage advice. Do not raise your children the way you were raised. They're different. They're living in different circumstances and especially the children of today, they need love. They're in a very difficult world so they need love. Now, this is a topic that we don't have too much time to cover, but it's so important because I speak about this a lot. But if you do not know what emotional intelligence is, it's really important that you know it because it is basically a modern framework that parallels perfectly with the prophetic example. And it's just a simple guide, a five-point guide that helps you to understand how to be more prophetic-like, right? So emotional intelligence to me is the same as sunnah because if you read the five qualities, then you'll understand. But it's basically the ability to identify and manage one's emotions as well as the emotions of others. The Prophet Sallallahu had that. He was perfect at that. And here are the five qualities. So when you become emotionally intelligent, you are self-aware. You know yourself well, your temperament, your uh, personality type, all those things that we should know, even these ideas like the love languages, right? We should know what your, you should know what your love language is and you should be able to communicate that. If you like gifts, you should tell your family, I love gifts. That's how I feel loved. If you like words of affirmation where people are giving you compliments when you prepare a dish, for example, and you're waiting, like, where's my feedback? Tell your family, I feel loved when you actually give me feedback over the things I do for you. If I clean the house, and you guys come out from being out all day and I have the house is spotless and beautiful and the clothes are done and laundry's done. I want recognition because I feel loved and appreciated. So tell me, good job. And husbands, you know, and wives, we have to do this to each other. We have to know each other's love languages, right? Um, motivate, uh, uh, sorry, um, the, the third quality, uh, quality time, right? Uh, spend time with each other. If that's your love language, that I want to be around you. I want you near me. Even if you're doing your own thing and I'm doing my thing, I just feel loved when I feel you, your presence, right? Tell your family that. Not just your spouse, but your children. They should know what your love language is. Or uh, physical touch. Some people are very affectionate. And you, if you don't feel like those daily touch-ins, you know, like a hug here, um, you know, a pat on the back or a kiss on the cheek, whatever it is that you feel just some affection and love, Tell your family that that is your way of receiving love and so that they can learn empathy, so they can learn to give, not just give what is comfortable for them, but give according to what you need. And then the last one is what we talked about, gifts, um, words of affirmation, um, quality time, physical touch, and acts of service. This is really important too. If you are juggling all the time, you're managing the house, responsibilities, you work outside, you have el you know, elder parents, uh, elderly parents you're taking care of, and it really means a lot to you when something is taken off of your checklist or to-do list because someone else did it for you. You're like, thank you. I don't have to worry about that. That's your love language. But communicate that to your spouse and your family so that they know how to love you accordingly, right? That's what self-awareness teaches you is you have to be aware, well aware of yourself so that you can teach other people how to you know, be around you in a healthy way. 
And then self-regulation is to control yourself, the ability to uh, not always give in to every impulse and every urge. If you are re reactive in all situations, you're a very dangerous person because you have no regulation. If you're constantly, like a button gets pushed and you explode always, you're triggered easily, your emotions are out of balance, you need work on regulating your behavior. And that comes from the taskia process, right? We're, we're taught taskia the nafs, you know, where we, we address the spiritual diseases of our heart. So there are books, Mataratul Qulub, the purification of the heart, 25 diseases of the heart, outlined for you, signs and symptoms. This is by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Excellent book. Everybody should have it. Read it. Look at it and be like, oh, wow, I have this disease and that disease and that disease. Okay, what can I do to get rid of it? I better work on myself. That you know, process of, of working on yourself makes you better as a human being. And guess what? You'll be better as a spouse. You'll be better as a mom. You'll be better as a dad, as a son, as a daughter, as a brother, as a sister, as a friend. Because you're working on yourself to become better to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it has a ripple effect to all of your relationships. But that regulation process is essential, right? And then motivation. You have to be motivated to, towards higher goals, right? You cannot just uh, have worldly goals, right? I was with the uh, Celebrate Mercy last night. And Shaykh Yasser Fahmi, may Allah protect and preserve him, gave a beautiful talk on this point. That a lot of us are so limited in our goals. Everybody is with their children even. Oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, doctor, engineer, lawyer. And we're like, yay, we're so accomplished as parents. You know, our children want to be these wonderful things. That's it? Right? He was like, that's it? You have really, you have to work on your dreams if that's your limit. If that's your ceiling to want to be a doctor, an engineer. What about, you know, greater, loftier aspirations that are more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not to say that there's anything wrong with going in the medical field or the law field. It's like we got to raise the bar for our children to aspire to greater things. Like all of us should make dua even right now. Ya Allah, make my children hufad of the Qur'an. Like why not? Make that dua. Ya Allah, give my children your book. Put it in their hearts. If they're going to sit here and listen to lyrics and, um, and watch all these shows and memorize all these lingos from commercials and, and whatever the shows they're watching, why are we not, you know, excited for them to learn his book and putting them on that path. We should want them to. They're sponges, right? So make du'as that are lofty for the other world, not just wealth and material success in this life. Sure, you can want those things, but if that's it, then you don't have the right lens, right? So motivation is always looking to something greater outside of this world. And then empathy, so important. Again, Time after time after time, you will see examples of the Prophet teaching us empathy, what it looks like, right? Uh, very, I mean, he, he, we know that when, uh, when he would be leading the prayer, and if he heard the wailing or the cries of an infant or a child or a toddler, what would happen? He would not read from the longer surahs. He would not stay in sajda for, you know, an extra 30, 40 seconds because he was empathizing with the child who has a need, but also with the mother whose heart is breaking to fulfill the need of her child and wishing the prayer was over soon, right? So this is the Prophet ﷺ teaching us. He, uh, many famous stories. One, once Ikrama, who is the son of Abu Jahal, wanted to meet with the Prophet ﷺ after the battle of uh, Uhud. And, and when he came, he, the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he commanded all of the, I'm sorry, battle of Badr. When he came, um, the Prophet ﷺ commanded the uh, Sahaba to not call Ikrama, right, Ibn Abi Jahl. Don't call him the son of the father of ignorance because that was his father's name and he did not want to break further Ikrama's heart. He just lost his dad in battle. So he instructed his Sahaba, don't call him that. Just call him by his name. That's empathy, right? He told us when there's two of you and a third person, don't speak in secret. Don't talk in a different language. It's rude. It makes the other person feel left out. You are hurting another person unnecessarily. So don't do that. This is empathy. Example after example after example. When a woman came to him once when he was sitting with his companions, imagine this. You're with your friends. You're, just, you know, you're, you're having your own social interactions in a beautiful setting. Everything is lovely. And then someone comes in disrupting the gathering in an agitated state. I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. Many of us would be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We may even 
A'udhu Billah, shame the person. What, what's going on? And not really know how to deal with that. We may not react properly because it's, we feel like it's an intrusion on our gathering, right? I'm speaking to someone. You, know, you don't know. People react in different ways. The Prophet Sallallahu Subhanallah, this woman, she had a mental health, she was known to have mental health problems. So she came in this agitated state saying, I need to talk to you about something. And he received her so beautifully. First he honored her and he listened to her. He let her say what she had to say. Then he said to her, pick any street in Medina and I will come and I will sit with you and I will listen to whatever grievances you want. You pick the street. I'll come to you. That's our Prophet ﷺ, right? And he did. He went to her and he, she was able to pour her heart out and he listened to her. So many examples with children, with animals, even animals. As I mentioned, many of our cultures are very heartless when it comes to the care of animals. We don't, uh, you see people, a'udhu uh, billah, kicking uh, cats and dogs and just, oh, they're disgusting, they're dirty. All of it is not from the Prophet ﷺ's example. He did not do that. He did not treat the creation of Allah that way. Subhanallah, he hugged the palm, the date palm tree, trunk when it wept, when he changed his mimbar. He literally hugged a tree that was wailing, and this is mutawatir, witnessed by many of the Sahaba. But he extended empathy to a tree. Many stories of empathy. We can go on and on, but he, especially with animals, uh, the camel, the bird, many stories. We need to inculcate empathy as adults so that we can then teach it to our children. And then social skills. Very important that we understand how to be around different groups of people. Adults should be comfortable talking to children. Children should be comfortable talking to adults. We need to teach our children to say salam, to not cower when an adult asks them, how are you? And you see a lot of shutdown of conversation. Children freeze. I don't know what to say. Why is that? That's wrong. It's a failure on us to not be able to give them the skills to be able to speak to people. So expose them to good people, to good company. It's, we can't just have them in, uh, you know, in these, um, in these controlled environments all the time with their peers where they never learn how to engage people of different backgrounds, of different ages. So we have to work on our own social skills to know that if we have our social anxiety or problems with that for ourselves and then teach it to our children. And, um, and so this is uh, the next, uh, so that's on emotional intelligence, but this is just a quick, I like acronyms because they're easy to remember. So this is a acronym on prophetic parenting, all the things that we just talked about that I hope is easy for you to remember. CPR. We know what CPR is, right? It's to resuscitate someone who is losing, uh, who cannot breathe, right? Or who's losing life. So in order to, to give them that life force, we, we give them air through CPR, right? So CPR, compassion. We need compassion if we want to be successful and actually give our children the best in line with the Prophet's lesson example, we have to be compassionate. And this is a really important point. Most of our struggles as adults are actually, in fact, egoistic, right? Egoistic is self, selfish. It's like my needs, right? Whereas children's struggles are egocentric. And what does that mean? Is they just want, like, they, they want you to, they, they want attention on, a, on themselves, but it's not, it's not the same. Because egoistic, it's like it's serving your needs. So when you're, and, and not to say that we obviously we have, you know, we, we care for our families and we're thinking of others. But sometimes in our daily exchanges, I mean, you know, when things get petty, when we're moody, when we're having those, you know, uh, interactions with our children that aren't going well, sometimes we can become egoistic where we're, it's a nefs. Whereas children just need attention. They just need um, to be seen and heard. But it's not really for any other purpose. There, there's not an ego involved there, right? They're struggling to find their voice, their place, their identity in a world that is intimidating and anxiety-inducing. So we have to be gentle with them, right? And this is, again, another hadith. You must be gentle. Verily, gentleness is not in anything except that it beautifies it, and it is not removed from anything except that it disgraces it. And then patience, right? When you're, uh, while your clock may always be ticking, remember children don't quite have their own concept of time. So sometimes we are rushing our children. If you're really looking at a lot of the 
um, negative interactions, we're rushing them a lot. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I got to go. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And then we get mad at them and explode on them when they don't do something in our time, right? I told you five minutes ago. I told you 10 minutes ago. If you're talking to a three, four, five year old, good luck. They don't know the difference between one minute, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. It's all, it's all relative to them because they're enjoying la la land in their games, right? But we get mad and we, we abuse children because, or we, with our words, and we get upset with them and explode on them because we think that they were disrespectful of our time that we set for them. It doesn't work that way. We have to understand how their minds work, They're especially children under seven that are in that stage of play where they are in an alternate world half the time. They're in an imaginary world, right? Because their minds are so creative, mashallah. They're not with us, you know, so our concept of time and theirs is different. And uh, we have to remember again this hadith of the Prophet said, Consideration is from God and haste is from the devil. At the end, even Allah, wa'ajila min shaitan. If you're rushing all the time, you have failed to time manage. So do not project that frustration onto your children and punish them because you are late for something, right? If you're late for something, then you were mismanaging your time. And now, if your child takes five extra minutes in the bathroom or to put on their shoes, it's not fair to make them feel bad or shame them because you're running late. No, own it. You failed, but be gentle, right? And then the rapport. Become an emotionally intelligent person and you'll know how to build prophetic rapport with your children so that they gravitate towards you instead of being intimidated, repelled, and distant from you. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, it is a great mercy of God that you are gentle. Right? We read that verse before. And kind towards them. For had you been harsh and hard-hearted, they would have all broken away from you. This is an excellent reminder of us, for us of the formula for anybody, not just you know, in our dawah, but even with our children. If we're not gentle and we're harsh, they will go from us. It's inevitable. If you're a harsh parent and you don't have this, these qualities, prophetic qualities, your children will not want to listen to you. They will not want to be around you. They will basically buy their time until they can leave your house. And, and how, what a, to me, that's just, that would be the most tragic thing ever, that my children are in the house begrudgingly hating every minute of it and just looking at the escape. As soon as I turn 18, as soon as I go to college, and I'll just bite my lip and make it through this. Like, that's our home environments, all the billah, that we've created homes where that's the reality, that they just can't wait to break free from the shackles of our parenting. But that's a lot of kids, I'll tell you. I work with you all the time. That is what many of them are thinking. They cannot wait to break free. So what are we doing to create environments, homes where children don't even want to spend time with us? Right? May Allah forgive us and, and guide us. So on this topic of um, the last point of emotional intelligence, I just wanted to mention this because it's really important. If you have young children especially, this is the time. I had a sister earlier asking me, she has a young girl, if she knows of any you know, classes and opportunities for her children. And you know, we explored some concepts, and then she said she was you know, going to put her in to public school. And I really caution, I just have to speak freely here, I really caution parents putting their children in public school. If you have options, I have to just speak from my heart. Because I work with youth, I know what's going on with them, and, I, and we all, if we're paying attention to the political environment we're living in, the schools are not what they were, and they are not what they were intended to be. It's not just about education anymore. It is about indoctrination. And you are seeing a lot of parents actually go away from public schools towards other private schools or homeschooling homeschool models because they are seeing it for themselves. They're looking at curriculum being handed to their children. Their children are asked to attend classes without parental consent. And, and they're forced into these conversations very young when th that are inappropriate that they're not ready for. So I really caution. Parents, please, if there are options for you, to not put your children in public school, no matter how high the ratings are, how amazing and stellar their programs are, what amazing STEM programs they have, please, for the love of God, if you want your children's iman to be preserved, don't send them there. Look for alternative options, inshallah. But I mentioned to her that in addition, she needs to look for like-minded families that have children of similar age so that they can create bonds, sacred bonds that can last. Because 
we're at a point in history where we have to, we have the, alhamdulillah, our community is strong. May Allah protect our community. We have our masajid. We have some semblance of community left. Other traditions don't have that. There are a lot of empty churches, a lot of empty temples, a lot of empty synagogues because people aren't going there. And, you know, may Allah not test us with the same fate. But we have to also, in addition to supporting our masajid and our institutions and our teachers, we also have to create communities, smaller communities of like-minded you know, people where we can come together and, our ch and raise our children together so that they have good suhba around them at all times and they don't seek out friends that have very different uh, views of, of life than, than they do. But that's what will happen if we don't supplement or, or offer them uh, relation, uh, you know, bonds, sacred bonds, um, and we prefer more dunya, right? Chasing the dunya is something that Again, a lot of people, it's one of the diseases of the heart, hubba dunya, is that we get too impressed and distracted by all of the worldly delights, right? And all the worldly, so we want money, we want wealth, and that's the, the, the goal, so then everything becomes about that. What school can I put my kid into that will get them the best test scores, that will get them the best colleges, that they can make a lot of money, and that we can travel, and we can eat, and we can have the best hotels, and we can fly business class, and we can, it's just dunya, the most important thing we can do is say, what can I do for myself, my family, my children, that their iman is intact because this world is te designed to test them. They will go through tests. And if we don't give them Islam and fortify them with the right um, protection over their hearts, then may Allah, we don't know, we, uh, we don't, we shouldn't even, I mean, I don't want to, we don't even want to go there, but we have to, you know, realize that, that, the, the fate, that their fate will be, um, will be perilous if that's the case. May Allah protect and preserve them. So it's our job again to to provide that. So what do sacred bonds look like? You know, the virtues of good company and friendship. This is again from the Quran. And keep yourself patient by being with those who call upon their Lord in the morning and evening, seeking His countenance. So if your friends and the people that you are bringing to your home or you're going to their home, don't do this. Don't call on Allah. They don't even pray. If you sit through dinner. And Maghrib enters and nobody gets up to pray. That's a problem. And if your children see that those are the types of people around, then when it comes time to pray at home, they're going to be like, ah, I don't feel like doing it. Because you've just shown them, all of your friends and all of the people around, that they don't care to pray. So it's, why can't I not pray either? I don't want to fast. There's people who don't fast. But they're your friends, so now your, parent, your children are seeing that that's normal and that's an option. Okay, I guess I don't need to fast either, Right? So you have to be very careful of the friends that you that you keep and that you bring into your intimate spaces, the intimate, right? Um, and make sure that they are those who call upon Allah, seeking His countenance. And let not your eyes pass beyond them, desiring adornments of the worldly life, right? Don't worry about climbing social, um, the, the social ladder and trying to get into that in-group and that group and, oh, I want to be invited to this uh, dawat and that wedding and that it's dunya. That shouldn't be your concern. If you never get inv invited to any of the social events that are happening, sorry. If you're not in getting invited to any of those events, then say alhamdulillah wa shukrullah, especially if you know what's going on there. If these are social environments where dancing and free mixing and a lot of, and lack of remembrance of Allah is happening, you didn't lose anything. Allah protected you, and you have to see it that way, right? So don't seek those th things out. And do not obey one whose heart we have made heedless of our remembrance and who follows his desire and whose affair is in ever in neglect. Make sure again that we choose the right company and the right people who become our, who influence us, right, in our, in our behavior. If they're um, heedless, if they're in ghafla, why are we following them? The Prophet ﷺ was reportedly asked, which of our companions are best? And he replied, one whose appearance reminds you of God and whose speech increases you in knowledge, and whose actions remind you of the hereafter. Again, this is the yardstick that we should measure the company that we keep. And also ourselves. Are we this? Are we these people? Are we people who remind other people of God? Are we people whose speech increases other people in knowledge? Do we have, you know, good actions that remind people of the hereafter? If we don't, mu'min al mir'atul mu'min, right? The believer is supposed to be a mirror for the believer. Why are we seeking out you know, excellent company, but then not also putting some investment in ourselves. So we have to start in ourselves. 
but we should also seek out excellent company. And the Prophet said, a person is on the religion of his companions. Therefore, let every one of you carefully consider the company that you keep. And then Ali radiallahu anh, reminds us, mix with the noble people. You become one of them. And keep away from evil people to protect yourself from their evils. Again, this is so essential because if we want our children to have excellent character, to preserve their iman, it starts with us and the people that we expose them to and the company that we keep. And we have to give primacy more than ever before, I would say honestly, to making sure our children have good sahba young. Make sure they have really good friends at a young age that have good adab, that their parents have good character because those parents may end up being your mentor, that your children's mentors. And I'll tell you, I live this reality. I know this reality. There will come a time when your teenagers and you may have, you know, maybe butting heads over something. But wallahi, it will be the greatest gift from you when you can say, I have so-and-so, my dear friend, who has a bond with my child, and I can call that person and say, hey, I'm having a rough time with so-and-so, you know, my child, my teen boy, girl. Can you please make some time to talk to them? It is a gift from Allah to have people in your life that you, th that you can turn to. But if you don't have anybody in your life that you can turn to for that role of mentorship when it's time, Please seek those people out now. Do it. It's, we don't believe in uh, this you know, fatalism or defeated attitude. No. Inshallah, put your trust in Allah and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you your children good suhbah. Literally make du'a. Add it to one of your Ramadan du'as. Ya Allah, bring the best company for my children. I need them to have really good friends. Give us good friends. Good, me and my husband uh, or me and my wife. Give us good friends so that when our children are um, with their children, I don't worry of what's going on in closed doors, right? Because I know their children are good children. I know their parents are good. I know they have the same philosophy about what, to, what they teach their children, what they give their children. But have this intention with the people that you uh, mix with so that, inshallah, Allah brings you the best of company for yourself and for your children. And just some further reminders, do not speak much without mentioning Allah. The Prophet ﷺ reminds us here, for too much speech without mentioning Allah hardens the heart and the hard-hearted are the farthest of all people from Allah. It's, um, it's something that we should be very intentional about and I, I really want to make this point. We, when we get invited to social gatherings, family, friends, you know, we can't always dictate how that's going to unfold. Sometimes you want to just go to preserve the bond, right? I want to, I want to call because that's sunnah. You get invited to somewhere, you go, you you respond. So your intention is, I don't want to hurt their heart. I don't want to offend them. They invited me. They thought of me. It's beautiful, but make part of your niya with Allah that, especially if you have like a religious family, secular family, family that's not interested in religion at all, make your niya to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be intentional about it. Ya Allah, make me a means or by, by attending this gathering of opening their hearts, you know. Give me the words. Um, prepare in advance. What are topics that you can talk about that are not overly religious, but maybe there's a beautiful moral lesson, value, something that you give them that it's like the perfume, you know, maker, right? That you've, you've sprayed them with the perfume of, of the beauty of our deen so that even though they may not have bought the bottle, right, from you, um, that that smell resonates with them and they love it. And then after you've left, they may recall that smell. And then maybe because you've left such a good impression on them, with your beautiful akhlaq and your intentionality to be in those gatherings for the sake of Allah, that maybe you will be the means where, where they uh, find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it was your beautiful akhlaq every time you entered their space. But have the intention that that's why you're going, not just because I want to be nice. You know what I mean? Like raise the bar. Because sometimes we respond to invites like at, with, with, with friends and family, but we don't take our intention to this level like elevate the intention, which is make me a means of guidance for this person. I love them. They're my family. They're my friends. They're not religious, but I love them. But maybe I can be the means, you know, and do, it, do that with that intention. And then here's the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says a good friend and a bad friend are like the perfume seller and a blacksmith, right? The perfume seller might give you some perfume as a gift or you might buy some from him or at least you smell the fragrance. As for the blacksmith, he might singe your clothes and at the very least you will breathe in the fumes we don't ever want to be out of the like the 
the last, the latter. We want to be the former. And we also want to surround ourselves with people who are not like the latter either. And then the parable of the believers and their affection, mercy, and compassion for each other is that of a body. When any limb aches, the whole body reacts and with sleeplessness and fever. And then the rights that we have for each other, that we have five rights over another to return the greeting of peace. We have to be better at the salam. Assalamu alaikum gets what? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Always elevate it, right? You can give the same, or, but it's better to give a greater greeting. Um, and if someone obviously says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, you don't say, Wa alaikum salam. You match their, their salam. But be in the practice of that, and whether it's verbally or even on text. And wallahi, I, I mentioned this in a previous talk this week. And just yesterday, I, um, I was sending a text and my son was next to me and he saw me write, because reflexive, WS, wassalam. And I, I said this reminder that we have to even expand our, our greeting. He said, mommy, <laughs> I said, I love you. Because he reminded me, we forget, we get into habits. So I said, thank you. And I went back and I changed it. So little children can be your teachers, but we should give the greeting in the best way possible. Visit when someone is sick. Follow the funeral procession. So even if you don't know the, the person who's deceased, it doesn't matter. If you know there's a funeral and you have time, go. Go to the funeral. Go to the janazah. Follow it. Because when you go, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may send a lot of unknown people, and maybe among them are sprinkled with saints. You know, Maybe there will be a bunch of saints that come for your time to pray over you. So be intentional. And then answer the invitation, as we mentioned, and respond to the sneeze, right? So someone sneezes and teach your children young. Alhamdulillah, what do we say? Ya Allah. What do we say? Yahdikum Allah wa yuslih ba'lakum, right? Learn the, learn the dua and teach them to your children. And another uh, narration of the Prophet says, when he seeks your advice, you counsel him, right? So be also the type that is picks up the phone when people... Um, reach out to you for help. Don't just turn them away because you're too busy with your own problems. You don't have time. That apathy and lack of concern for others will also come back to haunt you at some point when you need help and nobody wants to pick up your phone call. Everything, there's it's a sunnah of Allah, the law of reciprocity. How you are with others, Allah will show in, in, in your own life. So if you want to be that person who's like, ah, I don't have time, I'm too busy, then don't be surprised when nobody comes to your aid. Allah will show you these things, right? Do not hate each other, do not envy each other, do not turn away from each other, but rather be servants of Allah as brothers and sisters. It is not lawful for a Muslim to boycott his brother for more than three days. That's it. Three days, work it out. You have an ego problem after three days. You really do. Your ego is in charge. But if you, you got three days to deal with your issues, whatever the resentment is, whatever the you know hurt is, the pain is, but at, after three days, for the sake of Allah, you have to be willing to have that spine, pick up the phone or go to the, open the bedroom door. If it's between spouses, sometimes this happens. You know, you get upset with each other. And then it's a cold war, uh, not for three days, unfortunately, for weeks sometimes, for months. It's terrible. And shaitan is just loving it. But you have to challenge yourself to say, I have to get over my, my ego. So I need to go into, into that, their space and go, hey, we should talk. And just because you do that, you initiate conversation, doesn't mean you're saying I was, you're, you know, I'm, I'm completely in the wrong and you're in the right. What you're saying is I'm a grown-up, right? I'm a grown-up and I, I hold myself accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our Prophet said we have to work things out after three days, so here I am, let's work it out. That's what a grown-up does with a proper understanding who has command of their ego, right? And then the final thing, because I know this has gone on, forgive me. Well, one more thing, never ever forget so all of these advices and all of these reminders, of course, the, the culmination of that should lead us to constant reliance and turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have got to call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with what? As the Prophet ﷺ says, with certainty that he will answer you. Know that Allah will not answer the supplication of a heart that is negligent and distracted. So if we are not really all convinced of Allah's qudrat, of his power, and we are weak in our yaqeen, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, "Ma akhafu ala ummati ila da'af al yaqeen." I fear, but my for my ummah, the weakness of certainty that we don't have certainty in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He feared that for us, and we are in this age where we we make half-hearted du'as. Mm, if if you can, oh, but if you can to Allah, kun fayakun. He could do anything. You say it with. Ya Allah, you can do all things. Please, Ya Allah, 
make this easy for me. Allah, please fulfill this need, fulfill this need, whatever it is. But you do it with that certainty that Allah can do anything. And you want to be worthy of that. So you say, make me worthy, right? Forgive me. Whatever you need to say, call him by all of his beautiful names. But do it with certainty, inshallah, right? And, and be patient because Allah will answer our du'as either in this world he may delay it in the next world. He may replace it with something better. But to think for a moment that your du'as will not be answered is is tantamount to kufr, because what are you? That, that's you're 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 not realizing, or you're you're limiting Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And who are we to ever limit Allah? We can never do that, right? So don't let your mind go there. And if you go there, that's a waswasa from shaitan. I don't ever uh, presume to know what Allah will do, I just put my need out there. And the rest, I submit and I surrender. Right? So alhamdulillah, that is the end. Next week, inshallah, we will do balanced parenting. And uh, there's another one as well. I forgot the title of that, but you can see it in the, in the flyer. And we will close next week, inshallah. But I'm happy to stay on for any um, questions for a few more minutes. I know we went over. Any questions or, or comments? Yeah, no, it's an excellent, excellent question. Jazakallah khairan. So um, the sister asked about a situation where, you know, some of us want to come and, you know, to the to the sacred spaces to, to do our own worship. And uh, we may even bring our children just to be uh, participating in these beautiful uh, events and, and nights, of uh, especially of this month. But we may find that other families, because they also have the same intention, though they, they're here, they may not be managing their children um, with uh, correctly in, in that they give their children devices where it's unsupervised and maybe exposing um, not only themselves but also other neighboring children to content or just in general to the device um, you know without permission or without the uh, you know the, the, the desire of the parents who are praying so that's absolutely happened it, uh, it happens all the time and I'm sure we're all witness to that so I do think this goes back to personal responsibility and all of the things we talked about as parents we have to raise the bar and really be mindful of, um, of, of our spaces you know how, how you conduct your business at home is between you and Allah but your behavior that impacts other people is, is more you, you're held more accountable right so if you're gonna do something and it harms or potentially exposes other people to harm, that's going to be greater um, against you. It's going to be greater than whatever you're doing that it's just between you and, you know, you're, you're, I mean, it's just you're only uh, harming yourself. So we have to really take that to heart, and that's part of, you know, becoming more emotionally intelligent when I talked about the social skills and empathy and all of those things. If you're not thinking of other people in general because you're so self-centered, then it doesn't occur to you that, wait a second, my giving over my child a device because I can benefit from their distraction may in fact distract other people, right? Then that's not the right, you know, um, protocol. What, what, what else can I do? So this is where I think, I mean, a couple of things. Obviously, uh, we want our children to come to the massage. We want our children to be here. But this is where the parents have to coordinate. You know, there might be a time where, and I saw this actually happening here even uh, just earlier, but there might be a time where you have to hand off. So if you're wanting to do some extra prayers, you know, and your husband is free or your wife is free, they have to maintain the children while you're doing your prayers and you're responsible. You have a guardian basically taking care of that responsibility. That could be one thing to bring them, but the parents are handing off and tag teaming and taking that responsibility and allowing for each other to benefit from their worship and the space, right? Another thing is that you can find a, uh, if you if you really if it's difficult for you then find someone to watch the children sometimes people have um, you know other friends or family in the, in the you know in the masjid too that they may ask can you please watch them while I do some extra raka or whatever it is but look for helpers because there are sometimes people who have no problem they would love to sit and play with the children and this is also a good way to encourage community and so if your children are comfortable with that person ask them could you watch them for just a few minutes but to just immediately default to the device I think is really the issue here right because this becomes a nuisance in even the rest of the congregants not wanting to hear the sound of you know uh, shark whatever that song is um, baby shark shark now I don't want to hear baby shark when I'm doing you know uh, my my extra nawaf right or reading Quran but if you for you that works at home then you have to have a, a plan B for the for public spaces plan B is 
more considerate of other people, right? And so think uh, not so much about your own needs, but also how you can have a system that's mutually beneficial for everybody, also for the child, because it goes back to make sure the child is safe, feels good, is happy in the care of whoever you leave them, and not just you're not just neglecting them, of course, that would be terrible. Um, so those are all some suggestions. The other thing is, as a collective, as a community, we can certainly um, organize w with the... Um, masjid and ask if there is a way to hire or to you know bring in some services during prayer time so that we have actually qualified well-trained supervisors with children who know how to engage children who can maybe manage uh, you know the child programming part so that parents can come out here and enjoy all of the other talks and benefits of the of the you know, masjid without the fear of, oh no, is my kid being exposed to something or learning something that's not beneficial. So there are a lot of things we can do in the space. Outside of that, obviously the answer would be to leave them with other caretakers that you trust and then allow for the congregants to come together in peace. But I, my, I'm personally, I, I would love to see more children. We just have to do better about managing them. So it's an excellent question. Jazakallah khairan. Thanks. Any other questions? Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for coming. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Right. Sure. Sorry, uh, we're just going to wait for the microphone to turn on and then... Do you have any advice for parents um, for small but impactful habits that they could pick up to help them, you know, get closer to Allah SWT mm -hmm. and the Qur'an and the Prophet Sallam when they are managing smaller children who require perhaps a little bit more time, a little bit less sleep, things like that. So just small but impactful things that are easy to be consistent with. Sure, mashallah. Jazakallah khairan for the question. So I can only speak from what has worked for me and what I've seen other teachers or other people that I, I, I believe have also found, you know, things that work for them. And I think, you know, as, as we know, we're all creatures of habit, and children are certainly creatures of habit. So at a young age, I think if we really increase um, their connection with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their connection with nasheed, with dhikr, right, so that when they're very young, they understand that there's a routine to your day, right? We have the five daily prayers that are kind of interspersed throughout the day, and sometimes we do it at one time, another time we may do it another time, right? It's not as routine-based, right? But there's certain routines that can be fixed every day at a certain time. So one of the things I speak about often, which our teachers really encourage us to do, is as a family to uh, have that uh, have a practice of a litany, right, a wird. And so in the morning, for example, in my household, alhamdulillah, and this has been for decade, maybe over a decade now we've done this, and it works, is we have um, a, a Bluetooth speaker, so it reaches the house, everybody can hear it, and the boys know, I have two sons, that in the morning when they wake up, they go and they play the Wird, which is, you know, on a YouTube link, and it reaches the whole house, and then, um, you know, so that's the morning routine. We start the day off in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After that, we also listen to, uh, there's different nasheeds, you can listen to Dalai al-Khairat, um, the, uh, the Burda, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, um, there, there are many other du'as that you can l listen to as well, but we do usually Dalai al-Khairat, and then we also listen to Qur'an. And that's kind of our just day, like in terms of what's going on. Everybody could, because I homeschool, so my kids are doing their homeschooling work or I'm cooking, but there's always something playing that is connecting them to the Book of Allah. And alhamdulillah, as someone who used to teach children Quran, um, you know, previously, I know from working with children that they love to play even if they're playing with Legos or their blocks or drawing or coloring or painting and also be listening to something, right? Because they have that natural affinity to rhythm and rhyme and music, They're you know, musical. Most children love dance and song and play. So when you find them reciters that they really like, and I would create playlists for them, there are now, mashallah, I mentioned this last week, but there's a, an, an app called Qariya, Q-A-R-I-A-H, that's an all-female they're all, they're all female reciters. So if you have young girls, I would definitely encourage them to find maybe some 
connection there. I mean, certainly any of the great reciters, but just give them a curated list that's special to them and that it's their playlist, right? So that they can go and listen to certain surahs or um, nasheeds even, because if those are even more musical, right? And that becomes a routine for them and something that they always know is, is there. And for you, it actually helps because, um, you know, you'll see your children kind of almost in like a trance-like state when they're doing their games because children love, they're in the imaginary play, right? So part of the, the challenge for a lot of parents is they want our attention a lot, right? So it's like you're trying to cook and they're like, mommy, 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 come play, but come do this with me. And then we're divided and torn. But I think if there are times, pockets of time where you can keep them engaged in their activity, but also feel almost as if there is a presence with them, right, through the nasheeds or through the angelic, you know, realm, because there's angels, of course, that come, then I think you'll find those are good breaks for you. Like, oh, they're, they're enjoying their little nasheed song and dance while coloring or doing whatever, and you can then take care of other things. For you as a practice, the word is certainly important, but also finding the good that you can do throughout the day, even while you're doing daily tasks, right? So for some people, salawat, is something they love to do. They're people of, I know people who do thousand or more salawat a day. That's just their practice, which is the greatest uh, of, of, of God or la ilaha illallah, whatever dhikr that you feel is speaking to you, maybe calling on Allah's specific names, you know, that speak to what you're going through. But finding those ways to channel your, um, your mind back to Him, right, um, is, is really helpful. But having a habit of that, right? And inshallah, you know, those are the things that come to mind now that I think if you, you know, start with, inshallah, you'll feel that barakah, you know, in the household. And, and I, I would also say as a, as a, you know, aside to that is limiting um, the, the, the amount of, uh, you know, entertainment that they're watching. I know it's very normal for, because, you know, but I really think stipulating some, some clear limitations or, about like television especially is really important. They're too drawn to that. It's very, like what I said about the imaginary world, you're, you're teleporting them into someone else's imaginary world when they have all the imagination in their mind. And if you do that too much, then, then what they do is they don't want to come back into their world. Now they only want that world. And so I feel like although it's a crutch for some of us, if we create a dependency on that for our kids and we're stifling their own imagination and creativity, and that's, that's really sad if you think about it, right? So imposing restrictions, I would say, I mean, my, my kids knew 30 minutes to an hour a day. In most days, it never really happened. But that was always the limit of cartoons and devices, um, games. Like we have iPads. Uh, they are only allowed on Friday because our teachers taught us, like, Yom al is a day of Eid and celebration. So you should always have exciting things to do for your kids, right? So if you're going to teach them anything from the Sira or Quran, have their favorite treats with them. If they like cookies, cupcake, ice cream, just make it. It's okay. One day of the week to break some of these dietary restrictions for fun so that your children have this positive association with Allah and with Deen, right? The Jummah is a very special day is really important. And so in addition to doing that, I also added games. I said, you can have your games. But as they grew older, because now I have preteen and teen, they have to do chores on Friday. So Friday is their day of chores and then rewards. So this is now the next level of parenting, you know, where you, you want to teach them, inshallah, to work uh, and strive and, and really, um, you know, have, have, a, um, have some responsibility, inshallah. So, yeah, inshallah, that'll help. Yeah, and so I know we're way over. So uh, I think, inshallah, we will end here. Jazakum uh, khair. And thank you, everyone. Um, if there are any other questions, we can wait till next week. But I'll go ahead and end in dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-Asr inna l-insana la fi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa amalu salihati wa tawasu bil-haqi wa tawasu bil-sabr. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Subhanal rabbika rabbil izzati ama yusifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. And thank you so much everyone. For being here, inshallah, we will see you next week for the final uh, week, inshallah, of this course. Barakallahu feekum.